uh, sort of um, vice members were welcome to use Wi-Fi, usual mobile devices, as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Uh, we got Gemma up. We do not. Gemma's not joined us yet. Okay. Uh, sort of members, are there any apologies? None received. Uh, any notice from any member who's delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote under temporary standing orders? None received. None received. Any declarations of interest? None. Uh, moving straight on to chairperson's business, uh, item 3.1, uh, unique circumstance funding. In AQW's references made to 40 million of unique circumstance money as part of the new decade new approach financial package. The department was initially to coordinate bids for submission to the NIO. However, it appears that the NIO then advised the TEO in a letter how the money was to be allocated, including three million for the centenary commemoration. I wonder if the committee would be content to write to the TEO and the Royal Nairn Office seeking an update on the unique circumstance money and how it is to be spent. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, next one is ministerial standards. Uh, the main estimates makes reference to a relatively small spend of £5,000 under the authority of the Budget Act. The spend is described as being for a ministerial panel exercising functions of future commissioners of ministerial standards. This would appear to refer to a departmental announcement in March 2020 about the formation of an independent panel to investigate breaches to the ministerial code. It was understood, however, that the need that this had been superseded by the functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Northern Ireland Act 2021, which allows the Commissioner of Standards to investigate breaches of the ministerial code. Uh, just for a declaration of interest, I also sit in the Standards and Privileges Committee and raise this issue uh, with the Deputy Chair of the Standards and Privileges Committee as well. Uh, are we content to write to the Department in order to seek clarification on the spending? Agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Move on to 3.3 Ministerial Directions. Uh, the Department has published a list of Ministerial Directions for all Departments and dating back to 2007. The list includes those directions notified to the Controller and Auditor General and discussed at the PAC. However, it does not appear to be a complete list. It only includes two for the Department of Education and does not refer to the Ministerial Directions previously identified in AQWs in respect to GCSEs and A-level exams in 2020. Is the committee content to write to the department copying in the, uh, the PAC in order to seek clarification? I think we are. Agreed. Agreed. Chair, sorry, just before you move on, um, Mr. Catney has just advised that he's uh, going to have to leave early and wants to delegate his vote to Matthew. So, <laughs> uh, Pat, you can delegate your vote to Matthew, but only if he's here. <laughs> I'll stand in. Yeah, you can give it to me, Pat. Give it to me. Are you telling me he hasn't arrived yet? No. He never arrives in time. It's all his no, Star Wars references, he's a, that's he, what it is. He's, a much, he's in much in demand for radio and TV at the moment. <laughs> Must be an election in, in the often, Pat. <laughs> OK, move on to item number four, draft minutes of proceeding for the 19th of May 2021. Draft minutes of the meeting are the 19th of May at page 7. Are members content the draft minutes on the 19th of May are an accurate record of proceedings? If we are agreed, say aye. 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 There are no matters, uh, matters arising. There are no matters arising. Uh, next up is the Department for Finance, Financial Reporting, uh, Departments and Public Bodies Bill NI. We will now receive oral evidence from department officials on the forthcoming Financial Reporting, Departments and Public Bodies Bill NI. Uh, Stephen, can we bring on Joanne and Jeff onto Starleaf, please? Hi, Joanne. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jeff. Can you Hi, hear Chair. us okay? Hello. Excellent. Uh, just so that this uh, session has been recorded by Hansard. Uh, our brief, clerk's briefing notice is page 16. A copy of the uh, bill is at page 20. Previous departmental briefings on the financial reporting processes and the development of the MOU and the SSE dry run processes are on page 32. And relevant extracts from the 2012 Committee for Finance and Personnel reports on the review of budget processes at page 131. Uh, Joanne, Jeff, who's, who's speaking? I'm up, Chair. OK, Jeff, over to you, please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to update the Committee on this legislation and its context in the wider review of financial process. In December 2016, one of the last acts of the then executive was to agree the commencement of the review of financial process to simplify financial reporting 
to better align budgets, estimates, and resource accounts. There are a number of different systems which have an impact on the control and presentation of government expenditure. This includes budgetary controls and supply estimates presented to the Assembly for approval and resource accounts prepared by departments at the end of each financial year. These different systems and the way in which they have historically been maintained mean that there is significant misalignment between the different bases on which financial information is presented to the Assembly and the public. As the Committee is very much aware, this makes it difficult to understand the links and the interrelationships between them. The Bill, whilst short in length, deals with one aspect of the misalignment that exists. By amending the Government Resources and Accounts Act Northern Ireland 2001, to allow the Department of Finance to issue directions on the way departments prepare supply estimates. This provides for de departmental estimates and accounts to include the spending of non-departmental public bodies and other central government bodies for which the department has responsibility, thereby aligning with the budgetary treatment. The bill also provides for consultation with Treasury to prevent the designation of a body funded solely from a consolidated fund other than the Consolidated Fund of Northern Ireland. This is in line with current practice for each Westminster estimate process. Treasury consult with the executive and other devolved administrations on each of their designa designation orders. The bill itself is short with four clauses. Clause one contains the key changes that are required to the Government Resources and Accounts Act Northern Ireland 2001 in order to better align the estimates and accounts to budgets. I'm happy to go through the clauses should the committee want to explore that level of detail at this stage. Okay, thanks, uh, Jeff. I've got quite a few questions about this. Is obviously the, the first question is, um, obviously we're setting up an independent fiscal council. Uh, one of the things that remit to the independent fiscal council is to be able to closely monitor sort of government expenditure. Has there been any dialogue with um, the, the independent fiscal council yet about sort of reporting processes and the information flows that we want to see so we can have effective, uh, we have effective management? Um, cert certainly, Chair, we have been looking at um, a memorandum of understanding with the, the Fiscal Council and um, uh, we're, we are in the process of finalising that the, the way that information is processed and passed to the Fiscal Council, so that is, that is underway. I don't know if Joanne has anything else to say on that. No, Chair, I mean, Jeff, it, it's, it's early days yet and we have been engaging with the Fiscal Council, but those processes are still to be tied down. But it will be open and transparent, and we will provide the information that the fiscal council requests. Yeah. Uh, the next question is about arm's length bodies. Who's going to be included in this process? The, the intention, Chair, would be that most arm's length bodies within um, the departmental boundary would be included in this process. There will be some that. Um, are excluded from the process, uh, the likes of North and our water will be excluded just because of it will remain what they will call a misalignment. But the intention would be that the, the majority of all arms length bodies within the department boundaries will be included. And that will include all the NDPs? NDPBs, yes. Okay. And what about sort of obviously one of the things we need to do is because one of the problems we have as sort of committees uh, is the granularity. We're not really able to delve into sort of significant detail and some of the issues to do with that as well. So, sort of things like vol the voluntary grammar school sector or things like that, are, are they going to be included or excluded from this process or are they sitting outside? So, one, one of the, the concerns that I think was raised at the last committee session on the review of financial process was that question of transparency. And I think members were concerned that should the revised estimates follow the level of detail that had been in previous budgets, the process would actually reduce transparency. We are very much aware of that concern. and by it's not specifically related to the workings of this bill. Uh, we do want to provide reassurance that the new estimate structure would provide at least the level of transparency and granularity that currently exists in the estimate format. We'll be working with departments on their budget and estimate structures for the 22-23 financial year. The UF will ensure that the level of detail that's currently afforded to the committee in the estimate process will, at a minimum, be retained. Okay. Um, can they? Can you explain what is currently voted for in respect of the budget bill? What percentage of expenditure is currently not covered by the budget bill? And is it sort of around about 25% or more? Or does the non-voted expenditure include NDP spending plus capital? So does the Assembly currently vote on capital? No. The, um, the Assembly do not currently vote on capital. This is one of the changes that will 
um, occur with the review of financial process. Um, the, whilst, and at the minute, whilst um, the Assembly vote on the cash that is provided to non-departmental public bodies, it does not uh, vote on how those resources are spent within um, within the, the NDPB, so what's on pay and what's on uh, rent or rates or whatever it is. So um, that level of transparency will um, will kind of be flushed out with this uh, the application of this bill. So just for clarity, then, sort of uh, the current, you know, are we currently voting on income and expenditures separately, or is this to be altered so that we'll be in future voting on the net um, sort of controls within the estimates? You, you, yeah, so um, the, we will be voting on the, the the net position, but there will be a, a record of the the income. So uh, that level of detail will still be available to the committee. Yeah, and just the final one, sort of, uh, Jeff. Um, you've been running some dry runs. How's that worked? And has everybody participated? <sighs> everybody has. Participated to some degree, Chair. Um, I think that's <laughs> no, no, probably no. the way. No, no, no. We're the politicians. You give us that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've had we've had some good engagement on dry runs, um, and they have um, brought out um, some issues that we have been working on, um, and that departments will then uh, look to address in a further dry run process that we're that we're planning on in the coming months so um, we're learning lessons from that um, so that we can make sure that whenever we do actually introduce this in real time that the, the process is as smooth as possible yeah so a uh, proportion of the departments uh, how many have actually fully participated in arm, arm's length bodies to the degree that you think that we can successfully roll this out I, i'm confident chair that um the departments will successfully roll this out. Um, uh, I mean, there are, I, I don't know offhand of the kind of the, the percentage or, or the degree of, of those with arms length bodies, but certainly for those departments that have been engaging in the process, um, we're able to identify the issues. Um, and as I say, all departments have done that to some degree or other. Okay, thanks very much, Eddie. Thanks, sir. Jim? Yeah, I want to ask a few questions, if I might, about the guidance manual, um, which is in our pack. At paragraph 2.1, which is page 79 of our pack, it's very clear under the heading of tautness and realism. It says supply estimates must not be misleading. The Assembly expects the estimates to be based upon taut and realistic spending plans. This means that the provision being sought in the estimates must reflect the department's budget position as agreed by the executive. Why then is it that within our main estimates, which appear at page 168 of our pack, there is considerable headroom built in for spend that has not yet been agreed by the executive? If the guidance manual, require, manual requires tautness, why at this stage are we building in headroom, which is the very antithesis of tautness? If I can answer that one, Chair, just um, the estimates is not really Jeff's area. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, and we would prefer to avoid headroom, but unfortunately we also have to be pragmatic about that. There are circumstances where we know departments will need access to money. Um, for example, at the end of the last financial year where uh, allocations have not been made, but we knew that funding would need to be spent for the end of the, that financial year. It was important to allow that capacity. Similarly, in the main estimates, it's significantly less headroom than there would have been last financial year, but there is some built in, for example, for the victims' pensions, where we know that that funding will be provided. It, it has not been yet, but we know that it will be. And TO are obviously keen to make sure that they have that authority to do that. We're very transparent on the headroom that we do build, and we do notify the committee of that. In an ideal world, we'd obviously not. We would prefer not to have headroom. As I say, it's just the circumstances mean that if departments are to be able to spend the money they need to spend, we need to build that in. But we will absolutely be transparent about that. But there's not a lot of point in publishing guidance 
that requires tautness and saying that the provisions sought and estimates must reflect the department's budget position as agreed by the executive, when then the estimates just ignore that. What's the point in the guide? I think, I think the intention of the guidance is to make sure that departments are aware of the requirement that their estimate that they put forward to DOF actually reflects from the position agreed by the executive. We then, you're right, we do allow departments to identify very specific and uh, exceptional circumstances where they wish to move beyond that and that then is separately notified. I mean, as I've said, in an ideal world, you would not need headroom, but there are always circumstances which emerge, which mean that it's, it's, it is a, a solution that is required to ensure that spending can happen on those things which it needs to happen on. But the guidance is there to ensure that departments are aware that the default position must be the budget agreed by the Assembly and anything else is exceptional and is not something that we would actually prefer to do. But does it not allow slackness and lazy accounting? No, that's, that's certainly not the intention because departments have to make a very good case before we allow them to include headroom. And we do notify that headroom to the committee, which allows the committee to question us on why that headroom has been included. But you've already built in headroom in these estimates. Yes, I, I, as you will have noticed, that I don't have the list in front of me. There are my other pack of papers, but they're only for very specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly not the norm, and it's something we would like to avoid. But as I say, sometimes we have to be pragmatic and, and realise that the timing of the estimates and the time taken to both print the estimates and get the uh, it through the assembly means that if we were to include headroom, it would have an impact on the department's ability to deliver the things that it needs to deliver. Could I ask you a couple other? Oh, so, Jim, can I ask just a quick question there, a question about headroom. Joanne, our committee has been told now for weeks that we're expecting monies to be coming from the Treasury or from the NIO or from whatever source that the Secretary of State is going to sign off on. And now we're moving into the second quarter, and departments are within their headroom, particularly things about victims' pensions and the rest of it. We're now, as I say, we're into the second quarter, and we still have no confirmation that that money is going to be signed off on. So what degree of confidence can we put on that headroom actually being, uh, it's not going to end up as sort of being something that we're going to have to sort of claw back because, you know, we're now, it's June, very soon into June and the rest of it, you know, I've got some real concerns now that we're not actually saying sort of, we've been told time and time again this is going to be signed off on. You're accounting for it in the estimates on this headroom, but we still haven't had any confirmation. All we've had is saying we we think it may happen. So what degree of confidence do we actually have that it will? Um, setting aside the, the victims' pensions, on the other, the NDNA and the confidence supply, we've certainly no reason to believe that that will not be confirmed. Um, we also would like it confirmed sooner rather than later. Um, just in terms of headroom departments, the headroom is then built into the estimates to allow departments to spend the, fund, the money. Should that money be provided, they can't actually spend it until it's in their, their budget. So there, there are those controls as well, where we would not expect the department to spend the money simply because the headroom has been built in. They would need confidence in their budget. We would hope that um, either the NIO or the Treasury would confirm the uh, new deputy new approach of confidence supply funding quite soon. Um, obviously, the victims' pensions is different because the executive has given a commitment to providing that funding. So while we're still in discussions with the Treasury and with the NIO on that, we will provide that money, so that is not in any doubt. Okay, thanks, Jim. Sorry, sorry sure. A couple of other points that caught my eye in the guidance manual that I was puzzled about. A paragraph 210 of the guidance manual, which is page 81, uh, it talks about non voted spend could possibly be reduced. How could that be? Surely non voted spend is things like judicial salaries and all of that. In what circumstances would non-voted spend be reduced? Looking to see if, if Jeff can answer that. He might have more of the specifics or I can talk uh, in the generalities. I mean, I'm not aware of the, the, the specific situations, um, but in terms of what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, in the in the bill and in the review of financial processes, trying to ensure that um, the maximum amount of um, allocations and resources are brought through the, the assembly and brought through the committee. So things that are non-voted 
um, like, for instance, um, uh, the kind of uh, notional charges. Um, so department will do a notional charge, and it's it's not voted. It's not. It doesn't come within the 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 remit of the committee or the assembly. And what we what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that, that th those are reduced to a minimum, so that um, where we can maybe change that to an actual um, budget line and allow that then to be voted by the assembly, so that there's a bit more transparency in the process. That's where we're trying to reduce the, the idea of non-voted spend. It's not about reducing salaries or reducing those things that are that come under the consolidated fund standing services. I see. Um, paragraph 111, and I'm coming back onto my hobby horse of the sole authority of the budget bill. Paragraph 111 sets out four bullet points where expenditure uh, on the sole authority of the budget bill can be allowed. And the first one is the expenditure is no more than one and a half million a year. <laughs> and then the word or appears. Or is expected to last no more than two years and in the existing explicit statute of limits are respected and no specific legislation on the matter in question is before the assembly. The word or does not appear in managing public money. Why has it suddenly appeared here? Why are the two guidances not compatible? Again, if I can jump in there, um, I would need to check managing public money and talk to the estimates people just to, to check on that. But my understanding is that it is or is in the current estimates manual. So we would need to look at, look at that. If, if you're saying that managing public money is different, I'd need to actually look at that reference and check that. But I, I uh, my you. understanding is definitely that what is in the guidance that is issued now reflects what's in the current estimates manual. Well, I think if you look at paragraph 233 of managing public money, you'll find, yes, I misread it, that or does not exist there. But if you would check that, I'd be appreciative. Yeah, no, that, that's certainly something we will look at. Because I assume you agree the two guidance, you know, the guidance that you issue should be compatible with managing public money. Oh, yes, certainly. No be. argument there. We, we will check that. Thank you. OK, thanks. Alicia? Alicia, go ahead. Sir, I think you're muted. The chair? Yeah. yeah got it. Grandma, the chair of the Sajid Rove. It's very welcome uh, to the meeting this afternoon. And um, I welcome any sort of strategy that's adopted in any way at all to make uh, the understanding uh, of estimates and that more user friendly. Now, um, what we, or what features uh, would you describe now as, uh, and we'll say this new presentation, that will actually make it more user friendly? It's a, it's a good question. Um, uh, at the minute, if you pick up a budget document uh, and then you pick up an estimates document and do your best to do a, a comparison across those, it's very difficult to um, understand where the budget and the estimate for each department align. And yeah. the process that we are intending to to um, to implement uh, will make sure that whenever you pick up an estimates document it, um, and look at it, it is in the same format as the budget document. So effectively, what you're voting on is the same as the, the structure in the budget document, so that the two documents align um, more accurately, if not entirely, for each department. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just in addition, you know, something that's been fairly topical even within our finance uh, committee as well too, uh, is the role to be played, we'll say, by the fiscal council. Um, do you have any sort of um, uh, decisions already arrived at quite possibly, maybe, and what will the fiscal council might have in relation to that as well? I think this is... Um, I'm, I'm not going to sort of put words in the, in the fiscal council's mouth, but I, I suspect anything that um, aids the transparency of the financial process would be welcomed by the fiscal council. 
Um, we, we haven't liaised specifically on the review of financial process with them. Um, they're currently still um, understanding and getting information on budget and the, the kind of the processes as they are at this moment in time. But no doubt we will be discussing uh, the, how the estimates and how the, the budget will change because of the review of financial process in due course with them. Okay, so you would imagine that they would sort of have a remit to comment on issues uh, such as the presentation of the budget documents and that? Uh, yeah, again, I'm not going to put words in their mouth, but they, you know, they'll have a remit for whatever they want to. So it's it's quite possible that they will be able to comment on what and wish to comment on the format of the budget document and the information presented within the budget document. That's yeah. Okay. That that's good. Right. Good, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Malaysia. Matthew. Thank you. Um, thanks for the uh, evidence so far. Um, the explanatory note of the bill points out that says that um, this is in acts in December 2016 the um, review of financial process um, and that the bill deal, deals with uh, one aspect are there any other were there any other additions to the bill that were considered for inclusion uh, no not not at this stage um, uh, we are uh, the bill is very much focused on changing the Government Resource and Accounts Act um, to allow this alignment. There, there was no um, further additions considered at this stage. I do want to make the committee aware of a possible consequential amendment to the bill in relation to legislation for the Public Services Ombudsman. Um, and that particular piece of legislation references made to DOF's role in directing accounts for the Government Resources and Accounts Act in Northern Ireland. And we're considering looking at a change to reference both the resources, or both the accounts and the estimates, and that would properly align with the changes that we're now proposing for for government resources and accounts act. So we're seeking advice on that issue. Um, but there is no there was no other areas where we had considered um, introducing anything else in this bill. Okay, and um, uh, but 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 it, it, it's clear that this is only one part of the review of financial process. Can you just give us an update on where the other um, actions are from the, from the review? Yeah, so um, at, at this moment in time, we're kind of focused on this this element of it, but there will be a sort of a second stage to this to look at um, the, once we've implemented this process, once, once we've implemented this stage of the, the review of financial process and looked at how it has interacted, then we will look again at the, the misalignments that remain and see if we can adjust those and, and uh, implement those um, and that's a that's a stage down the line we're, we're looking at making sure that we have this element and this kind of key element of the financial process review implemented first of all and then we'll we'll turn our, our focus onto a second stage to try and uh, remove and reduce any other misalignments that, that exist and then uh, consider any other areas where uh, we may improve that transparency Matthew apologies can I just come in in a sec Jeff, could you just give us some clarification there? Because uh, sorry, I've just been talking to the clerk here. Um, you might have noticed us whispering away. Accounts and estimates. So you're looking. So could you ex just go a bit more explanation into that, please? Um, I'm I'm not 100% over the accounts element of it, but ultimately, what this this will do will allow us to issue directions um, on the accounts to allow the the accounts to align with the new estimate process at the moment. Um, uh, the accounts align with the, the older estimate process and the, the, the existing position. So it's just allow us to give directions so that um, whenever they're doing a comparison in the accounts to, to the, the legislation of the budget of the estimates that, that, that are there, then this allows them to do it to the new position. Okay. I, I, sorry, I need to get my head around that. I'm sort of not quite sort of clear on that at the moment, but I'll do that. Sorry, Matthew, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um... Last week, we um, considered some uh, correspondence. Um, uh, well, it wasn't correspondence; it was an S. <coughs> excuse me, an SR, uh, which is relatively straightforward, but it adds the Forest Service and the, Com and the Commissioner for S Survivors of Institutional Abuse to um, uh, to be consolidated into the whole of government accounts, and that's obviously UK wide, but. Um, this is obviously connected, relevant in terms of uh, account. We're talking about the account keeping of public bodies. We were quite concerned that the Forest Service hadn't previously been 
uh, incorporated in the whole of government accounts. Um, is that a uh, is that an anomaly, or is it symptomatic of a broader issue? Um, I, I, again, it's, it's not specifically my area of the accounts, but I understand that the way that we interact with the whole of government accounts on the UK basis is that um, elements and and um, bodies that are under five million pounds in um, in budget don't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily um, folded into that WGA. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be. It's a, I think it's a material issue. Um, uh, so I, I suspect that now that um, the Forest Service uh, are kind of registering there, I suspect it's just because they've maybe breached that and they've come over that, and therefore we need to in, consolidate them into the WTA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think we've written to the department in any case to ask for more information about whether it's a, it's a more... Um, uh, other, there are other bodies in that situation. And uh, a final question that goes back to something Melissa asked is really about um, uh, simplicity and transparency. You know, we had another um, budget debate yesterday. Obviously, I think you were sitting in the box, Jeff, patiently, probably suffering through that. So, probably apologies for having to endure that. But I mean, it does reinforce what is a, a systemic challenge here, which is that there is um, a shockingly poor level of public and assembly understanding of the budget pro our budget process is hieroglyphic basically and um, uh, extremely poorly understood by the assembly at large let alone the public um, it's fair to say that this is a relatively minute uh, improvement that will enable trained accountants to slightly better read across from uh, one financial document to another it, what it isn't is a, any kind of step change in terms of public understanding of how we do public finances here. That's a statement, but would you... <laughs> I know it's a slightly political one, but, but is it unfair? I mean, I, I think um, there would be a lot of people who would agree with that position. Um, we, we, this, is, this, is not the, this is not a panacea for understanding public expenditure, um, that, but it is a step in the right direction um, to allow um, better scrutiny and transparency by aligning the budget and the estimate process more fully so that the, the read across from one to the other is much easier. Um, there, there, will be, there will always be um, difficulty in understanding public expenditure um, from, from the public's point of view. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to... Uh, to get into it, you know, we, we talk about an 18 month learning curve for people who come into our area and are working in our area. Um, we appreciate that there is, um, and some people uh, will, will say that it is a very difficult thing to understand, and, and we appreciate that. Um, but what we will try and do is, um, with this particular piece of legislation, is allow a little bit more of that transparency um, and read across and a little bit more understanding. It. Make us move in the right direction, but it, you're right; it's it's not going to be something that is uh, makes everything really easy to understand immediately. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. So, Paul. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your your evidence so far. Uh, so, w what this bill actually does is allows the department to issue guidance and also uh, aligns bodies. That has a connection to a government department uh, and makes it a consistent read whenever we're looking at finances. Is that right? Yes, that would be right. So, so what's to stop? What's to? Where's the enforcement if there is need of one? And I don't know that there is. Uh, if a if a body doesn't produce a standardised. Uh, resource or estimate sheet? I mean, the, the, the bill will allow us to kind of give that direction. Um, so we, we will have that, the authority from, from the bill that allows us to, to give direction. Yeah. Um, and it's that direction then that departments must follow. Now, that the bill, as you'll, you'll see, doesn't apply necessarily to the uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office. Um, but um, the expectation is that they would follow in line as well. 
yeah, yeah. I see they get a whole clause of their or section at least of their their own. So so do you, do you have a list, Jeff, of the bodies that will be aligned? Uh, we will have a list of NDPBs within departments, um, and we'll have a list uh, of those that are um, not not going to be aligned. You know, so the, the ones that will be currently misaligned, like Northern Ireland Water. So, so what good reason is there to be misaligned? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's a good question. Um, it, so, it, it will depend um, partially on the way that some of their accounts are done. So. Um, Northern Ireland Water accounts are done on a different basis from the the rest of government, um, and I, I'm not sure of the the historic reasons behind that. Um, and I think it's possibly something to do along along the lines of um, the way that they were um, a GOCO or, or are a GOCO. Um, um, so I think there's there's an issue around how their accounts are structured um, and and the alignment of their accounts to whatever particular accounts. Um, directions it, that they are they're under is it anything um, if i can sorry if i can yeah, jump so in there ahead. sorry yeah i can ahead. explain the, the northern Ireland water um I, I think i think the first thing jeff jeff would be saying is it should be the exception that a body shouldn't be uh, aligned rather than the rule for northern Ireland water it is historic northern Ireland water was created as a government-owned company which had specific treatments in uh, sort of in in budgets estimates and accounts um, because water charging wasn't introduced as planned at that time, the uh, Office of National Statistics said the level of income being brought in by an iron iron water wasn't sufficient for it to be treated as a government-owned company, which would be treated as a public corporation, and therefore, in terms of budgets, it's treated as a non-departmental public body, but mm-hmm. in terms of legislation, it's set up as a government-owned company, and it has to prepare its accounts in that way. So it's because of that mismatch between the way it is designated for budgets by ONS and the way it is actually legally established means that we can't bring it inside the estimates and accounts finder because it would not uh, produce, as Jeff says, it wouldn't produce its accounts on that basis, so that's simply not possible. Um, there are probably a few others where there are very specific circumstances for that, and Jeff might, might have been going on to say a bit more, so I'll hand back to Jeff on that, but it should very much, I think, be the exception rather than the rule that we'll the body go. is misaligned. But we just give Northern Ireland Water thirty million additional. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of so why, why not use this? And again, we're told that anything's possible with legislation. Most yeah. things are possible with legislation. Why not use this opportunity to align every single body that gets government money? We would, that, that would be wider than the piece of work we're doing. That would need the department involved to make decisions on, on the way that those bodies are structured and governed. So it is something that should be looked at, but this isn't the, the way to do it. I mean, this, this is already a huge piece of work for departments just simply coping with aligning those bodies, which they are able to align. Um, and there should be very few. I mean, Jeff, as I said, he should, I don't have the list in front of me, but there should be there are a few bodies which will be misaligned, but it shouldn't be too many of them. So, so why, why explain again why the audit office isn't included? Because they're the audit office. So surely we should be able to audit the audit office. Surely. It, it's about sorry, and Jeff might want to jump in here. It's about the independence of the controller and auditor general. So it's not considered appropriate for us to be directing the controller auditor and general, controller and auditor general because of his independence. Jeff, do you want to say a bit more on that? Yeah, just it. it just... Just follows the original intention of the Government Resources and Accounts Act, um, Clause 13.2 of it, which excludes the Open Office from having to be directed uh, by account preparation by the Department of Finance. So it is about their independence um, and the fact that uh, they, they shouldn't be directed by us in terms of their accounts and or estimates. Would that be the same then for officers like the Ombudsman and the Utility Regulator then? So that's that's exactly what we're looking into in that potential consequential amendment. Um, so that it, we're looking into how those align and whether we need to um, adjust that uh, the legislation re- relating to them so that we can um, provide that estimates and, and accounts direction to them. And final questions, uh, Chair. How will this affect a department like education where you drop down money to uh, education boards, which then drops down money to schools itself. Well, in theory, it shouldn't. It shouldn't um, 
have any kind of impact on their day-to-day -day running. This, this really only will allow us to make sure that whatever we see in budgets um, is also then reflected in the estimate so that we can understand um, where funding is and where um, it, it's being spent and then kind of make sure that uh, the, the legislation follows appropriately. Okay, you say, last question, Chair, you say um, that there'll be no significant additional expenditure uh, if this bill was to come into place, but uh, we are talking about a change of, of operation here for these bodies, I take it. So surely that change will bring expense, will it not? Um, no, we're not, we're not talking about a change of operation on the ground. Effectively, um, all we're doing is we're saying that for the purposes of um, estimates uh, um, that, uh, and accounts that the, the bodies will be treated inside the departmental boundary where they, they aren't necessarily inside the departmental boundary at this moment in time. So there shouldn't be any additional uh, cost associated with it, um, so, so but it's just more uh, allowing us to direct how we um, issue guidance on the uh, an issue direction on the estimates process so so there won't be additional training for new guidance that you guys are going to sprinkle down there's not going to be a new form filling exercise for the accountants of each body no not not, not that i'm aware of not, no more than we would normally issue guidance and um training and direction upon financial activities okay thank you thank you chair okay thanks very much today uh, Pat. Okay. Thank you. Do you hear me okay, Chair? Yes? Yeah. I'm bring Jim in here. Thank you. The Assembly retaining the separate controls it states over the incoming expenditure rather than voting simply on net controls into the estimates. Uh, what assurances? I mean, how, how does it work uh, that uh, for an armed trans body should they be included in the accounts for Northern Ireland and where do they sit with the programme for government? So the, the, the plan would be that um, arm's length bodies budgets, uh, which are currently under, um, for, for the likes of an NDPB, for instance, um, an arm's length body, um, an NDPB, their budget is currently inside the, the departmental boundary. So the budget will reflect what they're spending their, their money on, whether it's staff or whether it's rent or rates or, or whatever it is. Um, but at the moment in the estimates, all we are voting for, um, all the assembly vote for is a cash grant to that um, to that arm's length body. So already there's a there's a, a very significant misalignment there. So this piece of legislation will allow us to direct the estimate so that the estimate um, we are voting for the same thing that's that's in the budget. So we'll be voting for um, that, the funding, you know, the areas that they're spending that money on, and staff and so on and so forth. So um, it, it allows us to to align those. Um, there is a there's a further work and a piece of work which is probably a little bit separate in terms of aligning program for government with budget. Um, and we're working with TEO colleagues on that and seeing how we can best align. A new program for government with the budget process um, to make sure that uh, there is that kind of top down from the the very um, the policy intent of the program for government feeding through into the budget process and then obviously down into the estimates process where it's legislated for. Mm -hmm. So we're voting. So when when we go in to the department, what, what are we currently voting on respect to the budget? Bill? I mean, are we talking about income? And expenditure are they separate so yes you're, you're you're currently voting voting on um different elements within uh, uh the department so you're you're voting on grants that they will pay out um admin that they will be on the, that's voted at a gro gross and net basis um whereas the budget is presented or sorry it's gross and uh, income and expenditure basis and whereas the, the budget is voted or the the budget is presented on a net basis, so it's aligning those, but then also providing uh, the information on income, so that there's no lack of transparency or no dilution of that transparency whenever we come to the, the revised estimate. And that would be the case for 2022 budget bill, then. 2022, 23 financial year, yes. All right, thanks, Chair. Mm, okay, Jim, you want to come back in again? Yeah, uh, can I just go back to 
some of the issues that Paul Frey was pursuing. Uh, basically, the boundary here is public bodies which have been ONS classified. So are there still public bodies NIW apart in Northern Ireland which have not been ONS classified? No, not, not that I am aware of. There's always a process of making sure that the classifications are correct with it for public bodies. Um, so there will always be um, correspondence with them on uh, the, the most up-to-date classification of things, but there's, there's not a, I'm not aware of any that are, um, certainly none of the, the long-standing public bodies that are, that are not classified by witness. Okay, and the second question was, in relation to this alignment, will that include the north-south bodies? Uh, yes, um, the, the north-south bodies are treated as non-departmental public bodies, um, and we would assume that that alignment will, yeah, that alignment will, will take place for them as well. So, how does that work, given that they work on a calendar financial year rather than April to March? Yes. So, so at the at the moment, what we're doing is we're using their calendar budget um, as a proxy in, in our normal budget process because the, the the difference between the two is quite isn't it's not material in any way. So um, that allows us to use their calendar budget in our financial year, and it'll be a similar process for the estimate. And will this alignment deal with the tardiness that there historically has been? Okay. in the approval of their budget plans? We are working on uh, as separately on making sure that we have uh, guidance in place and as much as possible to help uh, north-south bodies to get their business plans um, produced. And, uh, I think you dropped out, but... I think we all know that in some cases there's been a lag sometimes of as much as three or four years before plans are approved. Will this new legislation put an end to that? The new legislation will, uh, it doesn't directly impact on that, but as I say, separately we are working with um, the North South Ministerial Council and departments to make sure that guidance is in place in time and that we are affording every facility to the north south bodies to get their business plans approved on time and in advance of any calendar year thanks chair for that thank okay thanks very much uh, jeff just a few small questions translink where's translink sit in this uh i don't know offhand um chair i'm not sure offhand yeah no i'm, I'm just quite concerned because you know with northern iron water sitting outside uh, that this reporting process, which will you know, takes a substantial amount of the sort of the Department of Infrastructure budget and is going to increasingly take even more of the infrastructure's budget, we have the Independent Fiscal Council that should be looking quite closely at the alignment to make sure the alignment sort of works in, in particular ways. I mean, sort of, if you took out uh, Northern Ireland Water, you take out uh, potentially, and I'm not sure about TransLink, you start taking out very large chunks of what we're having visibility of. And again, you know, it's either, you know, to me, and I, you know, it's either reporting on all government expenditure and all government bodies, regardless of what structure they are, because that's the only way we're actually going to be able to make sure that we've got full visibility of the sort of the money coming in and coming out. So taking out elements of it, I think, is of concern. So again, sort of one of the questions I, I must ask again is about the issue, and we've we've heard about uh, Northern Ireland Water. Northern Ireland Water should be aligned with it because even though it's inverted commas a GOCO, it doesn't actually act as a GOCO. Mm -hmm. And I mean, also we've got issues with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, and has that status changed? Are we going to see the Northern Ireland Housing Executive going along the same lines as Northern Ireland Water? So that will be another area that we're not going to have full visibility of because it will be a different an accounting area as well. So there's some really significant questions that still need to be answered. Certainly, Chair, and I um, just just want to to reassure you that. There will be no lack of no, no dilution of the transparency that you currently have um, uh, through this new process, um, because we're making sure that 
in the, in the revised uh, estimates process, which aligns with the budget, we are at least providing the transparency and the granularity that you have in the estimates process at the moment. So, um, but certainly we can we can have a look at that. Uh, we're doing our best to make sure that we are including it, um, all uh, public bodies where we can uh, possibly, um, and uh, we can provide you um, with more detail on that in due course. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, if I can, sorry, sorry chair, if I can jump in there. I mean, I, I think the key here is that the, this review financial process will will not be a panacea for all ills. What we're seeking to do is to provide more transparency by aligning the budgets, estimates, and accounts processes. What we can't do as part of this process is is change some of the way some of the bodies are are set up. That that is something that would be wider than this, and which should be looked at, but it's not part of this review. Um, from memory, and we can, uh, Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong, or we can come back on this. TransLink is actually um, designated by the Office of National Statistics as a public corporation, which means that the only transactions which score in the department's budget are any funding that the department gives to or receives from TransLink. So then, by its nature, we can't bring it inside the estimates for its full expenditure, because then that would create a misalignment rather than removing one. No. So there are instances where it's not within the gift of this review to change the way a body has been designated for um, budget treatment by the ONS. That, that requires something much wider than we are able to do. Yeah, but obviously through the recent budget process and going through COVID, we've seen substantial amounts of transfer to both TransLink and to Northern Ireland Water throughout this period of time. Yeah. And it is... And, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, you're, up, you're absolutely right. And that's why I think, I think there's probably a broader piece of work. I'm just sort of highlighting that it's not part of this review. Um, the money that did go from the executive to TransLink is in budgets uh, and will be in the estimates at the moment. So there, there is transparency on the funding that goes from, from the executive to TransLink. What you're not getting in either budgets or estimates is what TransLink is the breakdown of what TransLink is spending that money on. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, thanks, Joanne and uh, Jeff, as usual. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to ask you to drop out for about. 40 seconds and then bring you back up again as well. Could you take, uh, Stephen, could you take Joanne and Jeff off the Starlink, please? Uh, can we bring all, Stephen, can we bring all the members back in? There we go. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, sort of, uh, sort of Peter has asked me to ask you at the end here. Um, would the committee like to indicate a view on in respect to the second stage of the bill? Are we content to let Go to bring it to the second stage, Paul. Uh, I think it's necessary. I just maybe I suspect it maybe doesn't go as far as we yeah. would have liked, but I, I think we I think we're generally supportive. I, I would want to know: Do uh, NI Water send in their estimates by drip feeding them, and does TransLink then wait a while and then push them all in at the one time? Dripping <laughs> taps. Uh. <laughs> Oh, you, you're, you're definitely. You know this is your last session. <laughs> you know this is your last session. Yeah. And, and look, I sort of. I'm speaking as the chair of the committee here. I think we welcome the legislation. We just don't. I'm just concerned it's not going far enough. And we need to be able to. Uh, you know, there is. My concern is that there's a lot of it's been sort of um, taken out. And we're not going to have that degree of uh, oversight to it because it's been, um, you know, between Northern Ireland Water, between TransLink, or whatever it happens to be. There's substantial amounts of government expenditure. Mm -hmm. We've also got the fiscal, you know, the independent fiscal council is supposed to be looking at it. And sort of, how do we sort of effectively manage this? You know, should we be saying that we agreed to the second stage of the bill? But when I get up and talk about it, I say, look, we, you know, we want more work done because we don't think it goes far enough. I certainly think, Chair, the principle of alignment is long overdue. Yeah. Like you go back to this financial review, it's yeah. near a decade old yeah. when it started. Yeah. So I think that's critical. Um, whether the scope is wide enough is, a, is maybe a consideration stage issue. Yeah. I think the principle is absolutely right. So, content for the second stage. Sorry. Matthew. 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 Uh, yeah, as apologies, Chair. I had to call, uh, pop out there. Um, I mean, I, th I agree with what um, Jim Alistair just said that th there's a uh, this is an anomaly that we can all agree needs to be resolved around alignment. Um, I suppose it will be for the so I don't think we should we, we, we should be fundamentally um, like you know delaying the, the introduction of this bill, which does something which is broadly thought to be positive. There is, a, however, a bigger question about whether 
this is an adequate legislative response to issues around um, uh, you know, lack of transparency in process and broader concerns. But there are two things. One, there's nothing stopping us you know, considering committee amendments, mm -hmm. I presume, when we come yep. to discuss this. Uh, but secondly, I think one of the challenges sometimes with, with these matters and probably with broader in, the, in this devolved administ administration looks at you know, how you improve, how you do governance sometimes because there's so much that could be done, people tend to get worried about boil. You know, there's a tendency sometimes to attempt to boil the ocean. So we shouldn't assume that this is that this relatively discrete piece of legislation can be the route to answer all the issues around financial transparency. Nor should we try and make it that. But we could conceivably discuss potential committee amendments. Yeah. I mean, but in, in, like, I would say as long as they're discreet, I don't think we want to get into... No, we don't want to major redrafting, but sorry, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we have to be careful that the ambit of the bill is set by the long title. Mm -hmm. So we need to be clear that the long title is sufficiently wide to Over anticipate all. any amendments. So I think we should write to the department and ask them to put on record what their interpretation of the long title is in terms of the capacity for amendment. Are we content for that? Looking around? Yep. Yep. Chair, members also content to write to the department and uh, ask Mr Alistair's question about the apparent discrepancy uh, with uh, managing public money in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Also to ask about the ALDs, who's in and who's, who's out. out. Uh, further information on their further amendments around the um, other um, ALDs. And then, Chair, I usually ask for stuff around bills, uh, the keeping schedule, delegated powers memorandum, and the EQICA screening document. It is only a small bill, so it be a very short keeping schedule, but just... Uh, it should be there for yeah, a complete list. To understand. So, so what, on top of that, we've asked for a list of all the bodies that's going to be affected. Can we ask for a list of all the bodies that's not going to be affected, yeah. And, yeah. and good reasons why they are, not, they are yeah. still going to be misaligned? Are, are we content? OK, thank you. Moving on to the next item of the agenda, which is the budget number two bill and main estimates. And can we bring Joanne, Stephen, can we bring Joanne, Barry and Rushin back in, please? Or Rushin's new to this one. Hi, Rushin. How are you? Can you hear us? We can't hear you. I can hear you, yes. Yes, excellent. Thanks very much indeed, Rushin. Yeah. And we've got, oh, who else have we got? Barry. We've got Barry. Hello. Go on, you back up. Yes. Yes, sorry, I forgot to click the camera on. <laughs> sorry about that, Joan. So uh, just to remind everybody of the session has been recorded by Hansard. Uh, following items are relevant to the agenda. The clerk's briefing note on page 161. The departmental briefing of the main estimates and budget bill on page 167. Copy of the main estimates at page 202. Copy the budget number two bill at page 554. Departmental correspondence on the main estimates at page 576. And in tabled items, members can find a copy of the in year monitoring guidance. Uh, sorry, who's going to speak, Joanne? Barry's actually going to give the opening statement. Uh, okay, and then we'll over to you, Barry. Then, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on the budget number two bill. Uh, as the committee will be aware, this budget bill is based on the main estimates for 2021-22. The main estimate position sets out departmental spending plans that the finance minister announced on the 1st of April 2021 and in his written ministerial statement on the 27th of April. Uh, that is the executive's 2021-22 final budget together with the additional in-year allocation, allocations which accompany this. In addition to this, there are a number of further items for which headroom has been included, and a number of these have been subsequently allocated in the May COVID exercise, which was agreed by the Executive on the 20th of May 2021. The main estimates do not include all of those most recent COVID allocations agreed by the Executive on the 20th of May, as these had not been confirmed at the time that the main estimates document was being finalised to be printed. These allocations, along with any further allocations agreed later in the year, will be included in the spring supplementary estimates uh, at the end of the financial year. 
The main estimate position is set out in the detailed document which has been provided to the committee, and this budget number two bill reflects the initial approval for the current financial year. Uh, I know that one of the key considerations for the committee is whether to agree accelerated passage for this bill. Mm -hmm. It is vitally important that this bill proceeds via accelerated passage to ensure that it reflects the executive's up-to-date expenditure plans and to ensure that departments will have access to the cash required to deliver services based on these expenditure plans. As I mentioned, this bill does not include provision for all of the most recent COVID allocations which were approved by the executive on the 20th of May, and this highlights why it is necessary for the bill to proceed via accelerated passage due to the fast pace at which the executive must manage public expenditure, particularly to deal with the COVID pandemic and the economic recovery. Until such times as this budget number two bill receives royal assent, departments are constrained by the spending limits set in the vote on account, which was contained in the Budget Act Northern Ireland 2021, which was passed in March of this year. The vote on account within the Budget Act Northern Ireland 2021 provided legislative cover for cash and resources based on 45% of the 2020 21 cash and resource position. This bill provides legislative cover then for the balance to complete for both cash and resources and will provide departments with additional spending power of 10.3 billion cash and 11.8 billion resource to enable them to continue delivering services until the spring supplementary estimates are brought forward. I appreciate the granting of accelerated passage is dependent on the committee having had ample opportunity for scrutiny of the bill. With the main estimates being based on the executive's final budget position, there has been ongoing engagement over the past number of months on this, and in addition to the debate which took place yesterday in the Assembly. And I would hope that the committee will be in a bit, uh, able to fully consider this position. We are happy to answer any questions that the committee may have today. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, Sir, so obviously, with some of the issues we're having is um, uh, they sort of. We're looking at sort of uh, the assembly research that asked the department for information on the COVID bed process for 2021, but sort of the data hasn't really been provided, and it does have a significant impact to the 21-22 bed budget. For us, you know, we have to ask ourselves as we've been appropriately consulted in respect of the 21-22 public expenditure proposals. And um, the last time uh, we had uh, this brought before us, and there was the, the question about accelerated passage. You know, we were basically told the world was going to fall in if we didn't sort of approve accelerated passage and where we were going to get to. And yet again, we have this coming in front of us, and we're sort of being asked to look at this. And we do understand the pressures, and we do understand the issues of COVID, and we do understand those issues as well. But again, we're being asked to sort of approve a process that we don't have full visibility of and granularity of where, of where we're getting to as well. So that's sort of something you know significant we have to ask our question. And I think it was in a previous uh, session, uh, sort of Barry, and I sort of asked the question of uh, I think it was Joanne at the time. But you know we've been told quite a lot about the headroom process and the fact that we're expecting. Uh, we've been told time and time again from this committee that we're going to get sign off from the NIO or from the Treasury about a lot of the issues to do with headroom. And within the sort of the budgetary process and the rest of it, we've already seen that you know departments have been told that the money's coming. Yet yeah, here we are into the second quarter and we still haven't got confirmation that it's going. So the question I have is, you know, what sort of degree of confidence can we actually put in sort of what's been presented to us today? Yeah. For, for the majority of those uh, headroom items, which I've highlighted in the, the briefing paper that was provided to the, the committee, for the majority of those where the funding is being provided by UKG, uh, these have been confirmed in the UK government's main estimates. Uh, now, that, that is separate from any letter which would separately follow from the Secretary of State, but if in the majority of those cases that has been provided. Uh, now, that, that will then form part of, uh, Joanne, correct me if I'm wrong on this, that will then form part of the executive's consideration of June monitoring uh, and, and consider at, at what point it is, it is appropriate to confirm to the individual departments what the, the, the specific allocations are to those departments. I think Barry jumping in there. I, I, I think I'm sorry we had a brief discussion on it in the last session. I think the items we're waiting to be confirmed are basically most of the NDNA and the confidence and supply funding. I 
think all of the other funding has been confirmed by the Treasury, but I think it's the NDNA and the Conference of Supply Funding we're waiting on, on confirmation from either the Treasury or the NIO on. Um, we still anticipate getting that, that funding. We have not been told that we're not getting that funding, but it hasn't been actually confirmed as yet. So just to get it right, it is in the UK main estimate that the funding will come to Northern Ireland, but until we have formal write-off or approval from, I presume it's the Secretary of State, we cannot say definitively that we can actually utilise that money. And the decisions on particular some areas that uh, the Executive will have to sign off on, based on the June monitoring round, that still, which will be taking place in two weeks' time or three weeks' time, still requires the sign-off from the Secretary of State, or else all that money in that headroom is not, um, we can't be utilising that. The, the only funding, I'm sorry, Barry will correct me if I'm wrong, the only funding we're waiting for confirmation on it is purely the NDNA and the confidence and supply, either from the Treasury or from the Secretary of State. The funding, uh, what appears in the UK government's estimates is the, the cash grant to uh, the Northern Ireland Executive, so that, that is not in doubt. Um, the June monitoring round will hand, will confirm that the, you know the funding of the additional Barnet consequentials we've got. Barry, um, if you want to say perhaps a little bit more about how my uh, sorry, there was a list of headroom in front of me, but I think as you say, the majority of it has been confirmed. Yeah. It's just those few very specific issues we're waiting on. Yeah. yeah Joanne, I, I, Joanne, I, I can, can run, just ask I, you a question? Can we say majority of funding, and we've heard the word majority used a couple of times. What are we talking about? How much are we saying that we haven't got sign off on? Is there any figure that you could be reporting to us? There, there's one, uh, apologies, uh, Joanne, there, there's one there that I'm aware, of, which was uh, the New Deal for Northern Ireland funding, which uh, I think. Uh, correct in saying, I think it's 12.3 million for the Department for Economy. Uh, that is, that we're still waiting confirmation of. Uh, and I, I believe the other elements for which we have included headroom, which just to run down through them, is uh, 16.5 million uh, for the Department uh, of Education, which is confidence and supply funding. Uh, uh, that that has been confirmed by Treasury. Uh, the Nine million of uh, new sorry, new deal Northern Ireland funding, which has been confirmed by Treasury, uh, and five million uh, a contribution from UK G towards the the nine million in total for tackling paramilitaries funding, which is provided to a headroom for the Department of Justice. That has been confirmed by Treasury. Uh, so uh, the of, of the of the list of headroom that was that uh, was set out in your in the briefing paper, my understanding is the the only one that we're still waiting on confirmation from Treasury is I think it was twelve point three million in total for the Department for Economy for Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah, sorry, Chair, if I can jump in. That that was my mistake. Bar Barry's right. I was slightly out of date with my information, so Barry's perfectly right. There, there's only that that one issue which hasn't yet been confirmed by Treasury. Okay. So therefore, the head, you know, we will go from headroom to actual uh, when we get to the June monitoring round. Then, yes, that's, that's yes. right. We will. Yes. So we're being asked to bring this bill through before the June monitoring, and the June monitoring will get rid of the headroom. Yes, it, it will do. Yes, it, it'll confirm the majority of that. Okay. Okay, Alicia. Can the department advise on the extent uh, to what departments uh, fulfilled their spending commitments by the end of 2020-21, and how much resource and capital were in fact carried over from 2021 to 2022, and how much was lost to Westminster? Okay, if I can answer that one. We're, we're still working through those figures. We're waiting for some final figures being confirmed. So we're, we're not in a, a position to talk about the, the actual provisional outturn figures or uh, confirmed underspend figures yet. 
but we are not anticipating any funding being lost to Westminster. And as part of the June monitoring round, we will confirm how much money will be carried forward into the next financial year. Okay, thank you. Any other members? Yep. Yeah, Jim. Um, in relation to the, um, not the administration, but the payment of victims funding uh, for the pension, surely that would need to appear in the ambit of some department. I was just looking there at the ambits of the executive office and I don't see it. I don't think it's in the justice one. So is it in any of the ambits? Uh, sorry, uh, could, could I ask you, uh, just the line just broke up and I missed the very first right. part of what you said there. Sorry, I'm, referring to the, that for me? Sorry. I'm referring to the upcoming expenditure in paying the victim's pension, the troubles victim's pension. Uh, we do know that there's, I think it's 6.7 in the budget for the administration of that, but there's no um, actual money for the payment of it. And I was asking, surely the such provision needs to appear in the ambit of some department. It's certainly not in the executive office. Is it somewhere else? Is it? Barry's just checking there. I yeah. I think I'm. I think I'm correct in saying, and I apologies because I, I don't have all the details in front of me. I think the the actual payments themselves would be administered through the compensation agency in the Department of Justice. So I think they would be included just under the 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 uh, the role of the compensation agency itself. Yeah, page three nine seven. Three nine seven. Three 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 nine seven. Just have a look. Three nine seven. But if uh, what, I can, what I can say is we can, we can certainly provide you just with confirmation uh, when I get the details from both the EO and the EOJ just to confirm where the, the uh, that cover is included. It would have to be in there somewhere to be payable. Yes, yeah, I think it is. It says mm -hmm. uh, costs relating to victims payment board and troubles permanent disabled payment scheme. And other functions managed at service level agreements within that that's on page. Yep. Okay. But it's yep, not thanks. quantified, thanks. is that right? Is it quantified anywhere? There, there, there isn't. There is the uh, uh, separately quantified in is in the sorry reaching across here. Uh, it's just in the notes. Sorry, no apologies. No, there isn't a separate, uh, there isn't a separate figure separately identified in the main estimates document specifically for that payment. So, if uh, in the what, course, what I can say is, is, as was provided in the, the briefing paper, that we have included a figure of nineteen million for that, and that that it has been provided as headroom because, as you were, there hasn't been a specific allocation made to the department for that yet, although the executive have made the commitment that it, that it will be funded so, uh, once the, the negotiations with, with UK government have been reached their conclusion. I just add in there, Barry, too, that that £19 million is included in the first line of the TEO estimate and function line A1. Executive support and policy development. There's not a separate line, a separate function line for it, but it's included in there. In the TEO. What page is that? In the TEO part two. Um, sorry, I've got a print. I don't have the the printed document that you have. Aye. Um, but in TEO's part two. It's page, two, page 208 of the estimate document. And that's function line A1. A1, yeah. So that seems to be page 433 of our pack. Is that right? Yep. The executive support and policy development. Yes, the so 19 million is included in there. 
as well, hidden. Well, I, I would stress this is headroom that has been provided to make sure that the department has the ability to make the payments and to spend the cash required to make those payments. The actual allocation for that has not yet been made by the executive, and that will be required during a monitoring round during the course of the year. And that, as, as you're aware, is subject still to the negotiations between the executive and the uh, UK government as to what the source of that funding will be. So uh, once an allocation is made, then it will it'll appear in a, a specific budget line within that department uh, budget. But at the minute, uh, they decided, we took the decision, as I explained in the, in the briefing paper provided to the committee, that in order to ensure that the, the department has the ability to make a payment, that it was uh, justified to include that as headroom. So can we just going to just come in there just quick I'm sorry Jim for cutting across you there I apologize for that so it's included in both the justice line and the executive office line the administration I'm looking at that I'm looking at the no, sort of it's it, the the budget cover is provided in the executive office's line uh, my my understanding is the intention uh, between the two departments is based on a service level agreement that the executive office will then pay money over to the Department of Justice as the, as is required in order to make make the the actual payments to the the recipients. But in A one, the budget cover rests with the executive office. In A one for for the current financial year, the provision is one hundred and twelve million. And last year, That's the, last year's provision was provision was fifty two million. So there's an extra sixty million in there somewhere. That's mm -hmm. not all for the pension. What's that for? No way. No, you're correct. That is is not all for the pension. What's so it for? Uh, yes, there, there there will have been other there will have been other things uh, that the executive office have uh, received. A budget for and can you tell us what those are? Uh, I I think we'll, we'll check and get back to you that rather than give me incorrect information. It could be for historical institutional abuse, but we will check and come back with that so as to make sure we're given the right yeah. information. Does it include language provision registration? Again, we, we will check and come back on the detail of that. We wouldn't want to, to give the, the wrong information, so we'll check and come back on that quite quickly to you. It certainly is a massive jump. Of sixty million from fifty two. Like yes, I know it is, and we will confirm what, what the reason for that is. Thank you. Okay, Matthew, sorry, please ask your question. Still reading into this. Yeah. Okay. My, my turn. Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you. Um, all. Uh, just on so the budget number two bill. Um, so I'm getting it right. It's. Uh, because obviously the budget document we've been deb we debated yesterday did not fully incorporate the document did not fully incorporate um, the allocations made in the twentieth. Not only did it not incorporate the allocations made in the twentieth of May, it didn't incorporate I think a previous two tranches of allocations that were announced. But but the budget number two bill will include headroom so that everything announced up to and including the twentieth of May can be spent. Yes, could I just caveat that by, by, by saying not all of the allocations which were announced on the 20th of May included within this budget bill, because the budget bill itself and the main estimates document had to be finalised before the 20th of May and before the executive made those decisions. We included some headroom for some items, which, for example, some of the business support grants, which, which uh, were agreed. Uh, because we knew it was important that departments had sufficient cover to be able to spend the cash uh, when that allocation was agreed, but there, not all of the allocations that were agreed on the 20th of May are included on this. And that was purely a timing issue that we, because of the timing that that, uh, that the executive were meeting to agree that we couldn't have delayed finalising this bill and the the main estimates document. Uh, to wait that decision, or else we wouldn't have been able to get the, the, the bill through. 
Okay, but you won't necessarily it won't necessarily need to be incorporated as extra lines in a in a budget number three bill, will it? Or will it? It'll simply be that there's headroom in there that the money can be spent, and it won't be. It's not incorporated in the sense that it's not yeah. described in the text of the bill. Is that right? But it's or the estimates, but it's not. That doesn't mean the money can't be spent. No, well, the, it, as as will happen with the June monitoring round, the October monitoring round, and so on. Any any additional allocations which haven't been incorporated in yeah. this bill will then be picked up with the spring supplementary estimates next February, along with what will be the the budget uh, bill uh, 2022, and uh, and and that, that in turn will then proceed and uh, Obinwell have a well sent it before the end of the last financial year, so that that, will, that should pick up any uh, any additional allocations that that not, happen throughout the rest of this year, including those outstanding ones from the 20th of May. So you're, not, you're certainly not anticipating a budget number three bill? I, I really, really hope not. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate that last year was totally unprecedented in, in the, because of the, the fast pace of what happened with uh, with, with the pandemic. I, I remember sitting in, in, I think it was in February, uh, 2020, I asked a similar question about do, did we think we had enough cover for anything that COVID was going to throw at us? At that stage, we hoped we did. Yeah. N- nobody at that stage knew what COVID was going to be like. I, I, if you'd forgive me, I don't want to be hostage to fortune. Okay. Um, and in the mid, uh, the, the COVID part of the trajectory that is on. Okay, thank you. And in, in on the in the twentieth of May, written ministerial. Um, uh, I suspect you will tell me that this is a question for TU, or that you'll come back to me. But there was a, it said TU is being allocated one point three million to support the ongoing work of the department in COVID recovery, including the executive COVID task force. Um, now, that seems to me that that could be in court. That would be easily. Um, uh, Resummarized in the future estimates document, would it be do you are you aware of what that 1.3 million relates to specifically, or am I asking you something too specific? If it's quite specific, I think we would need to um, yeah. get more information on that from I, I TEO. They they did bid for 2.3 million, and I know there was the 1.3 million was allocated. Okay. Um, which had been included as headroom, so is in this bill. Um. But in terms of what it relates to, we would need to ask TEU for more information. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, just a quick one, John. Sir, has the executive committee seen these uh, seen these uh, these estimates in this uh, in this bill? No, we. we Sorry, Roshi, you answer. Sorry, I was just going to say copies of the bill and the estimates have been provided to the executive in advance. No, the executive uh, well, committee, actually, sorry, uh, the TEO committee here. Sorry, oh, well, the department should have shared their their estimate with their committee um, prior to now. So the TEO committee should have seen their individual department's estimate. Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, team. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Rushin. Thank you very much indeed. Let me uh, take them off. Um, Darley, please. Thank you. Um. Mm. Mm. <laughs> How's that go down in Hansard? The chair of the committee went. Mm. Uh, look, um, members, that uh, next week assembly research will also brief on the main estimates. The department will return to answer any remaining questions that the members may have. Uh, the committee will then be asked next week whether it feels that it has been sufficiently consulted in respect of the executive's uh, public expenditure proposals, and if necessary, we can then thus grant accelerated passage to the budget number two bill. Uh, members, do you have any other? Questions or anything we would specifically like raised to have a look at? Okay. No, I'll see. We'll decide that next week. Okay. Thanks very much, Eddie. Uh, I think we need to.
probably a bit more information. I need to conjugate on others. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, team subordinate legislation SR 2021-127, the official statistics amendment order Northern Ireland 2021. The Department has made a statutory rule under powers conferred under Section 61B and 2 of the Westminster Statistics and Registration Service Act 2007. Relevant papers are at pages 587 to 633. The statutory rule will amend the Official Statistics Order Northern Ireland 2012 to include the Education Authority, Invest Northern Ireland and the Labour Relations Agency as producers of official statistics. The Committee agreed that it was content of the related SL1 on the 21st of April 2021. The Department advises that the statutory rule does not deviate from the original SL1. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution, assembly procedure and is expected to come into operation on 1 July 2021 after it is affirmed by the Assembly. If members are content, therefore, that the Committee for Finance has considered the proposed statutory rule SR 2021-127, the Official Statistics Amendment Order in Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Moving on to the correspondence. Looking at the correspondence index, members are asked to note the index of the 10 received items of correspondence at page 635. Uh, first item, House of Lords Subcommittee Northern Ireland Protocol. Members asked to note at page 638 correspondence from the House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee on the Protocol on Northern Ireland, uh, chaired by Lord Jay. The committee noted at last week's meeting that the subcommittee has launched an introductory inquiry into the current state of play in the Protocol. Uh, members agreed that they are content for me to engage with the subcommittee as chairperson of the Committee for Finance. Are we content to note? Noted. Okay. Uh, Next one, 9.3 NICS pensions uh, retirement provisions. Members are asked to note a departmental response on page 640 regarding the civil service pensions retirement provisions. The department confirms that members of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and some other schemes can partially retire by at least 20% if agreed by line management, and I think that works out at one day a week, and claim their pension and receive pay subject to the abatement limit. limit. This will restrict partial retirees' total payment to mo no more than that which was received at retirement. Some non-NICS schemes, e.g. teachers and local government, have no abatement limits. The Department of Finance appears to indicate that around 2,000 people, mostly in Northern Ireland Civil Service, are benefiting from these arrangements, but the further 5,700 could benefit in the future. Bearing in mind the Northern Ireland Civil Service employs around about 23,000 people, so that's about 9% of the organisation is a billing of this process. Our members are content to note, or would wish to make any comment? No, oh, sorry. Jim, go ahead. Um, I don't know who, who found this out. Was it Paul or Jim? One of the two of you. Jim, this is an extraordinary <laughs> mission. Um, talk about having your cake and eating it. Um, <laughs> I, what I'd like to know is, has anybody who ever applies this, are they ever turned down? It says it's, it's mm. at the discretion of the department. Mm. But I suspect that this is an automatic entitlement, as are things like increments as well, which everyone seems to get. And outside of this small, very privileged group of people, this is an extraordinarily rare uh, benefit that <clears throat> nobody knew about. For instance, the, I'm the chairman of the, Pen the Assembly Trustees. And we would never rely on MLA <laughs> to get away with this. You know, there's no problem. Not, Hardly have esteemed you. <laughs> resign, resign. <laughs> an MLA, of course, could partially retire. But, for instance, we are not allowed Some to... Have. Even if you're 80 in our scheme, you're not allowed to take your pension and remain an MLA. Yeah. yeah and we, oh, we have people in that, have had people in that position. So I'd love to know where this has come from and how it can mm -hmm. be justified given the huge changes in pensions that have accrued as a result of, of the, the major review, which basically did away with final salary schemes and put everyone on a career average and had to cut the budget dramatically. But still, <laughs> lessening away, there's potentially 5,000 people who can avail of this scheme. Well, no, that would be 7,000 if they availed of it as if well. If they the 2,000 plus the 5,000. It is 2 plus 5, is it? Yeah. There's yeah. still 5,000 out there. Well, it's almost 6, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, so had... Uh, Mr. Alistair, not sort of we, we dug away and found this out. No one would have any of the wiser. And secondly, what is the cost to the public exchequer of this provision, this special provision for an elite bunch, a group of civil servants? 
Matthew, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, it is good that it's, that it's been hooked out, so I, I, I congratulate our, our committee colleague on, on, on getting it out. I think, actually, to me, the more important thing here than, I mean, it, it's not irrelevant what Jim Wells is saying about, you know, cost to the public purse, et cetera, but I think the bigger question is whether this is having, creating an incentive for mm. people, no harm to these people, but given we have a very old civil service already, to be blunt, and this is we've been, all, this is a structural challenge that we face. I think Why would you like? eighty percent of the senior civil service is over fifty. We basically face a cliff edge. Is uh, so I think it's worth us asking whether this is reinforcing that because it seems to basically be an incentive to n not retire or to retire but continue working because you have there is a financial inducement and, I'm, and like I don't blame individuals for availing themselves of it, particularly if they want to continue working in some form that they're not being individually malign or or anything like that. But if the system, I, I just think it's worth us pursuing asking the question: What is the department and next HR who's supposed to be coming up with a, a work, like an overall yeah. strategy and work plan? Like are they? And do, is this a problem? Is this helping create the problem where the workforce profile is much older than it should be? Sir, yeah, I would agree with that with regards to Matthew's line of inquiry there. Also, look at it at the other side of things whereby you're looking at youth recruitment, uh, one cent of uh, what uh, direction of travel do you go if you're a young person in civil service and you see maybe promotional uh, uh, positions blocked off, um, you know, or, or positions filled by uh, people who are semi-retired uh, and see no prospect then of, of getting up the promotional ladder, that's enough to to uh, uh, to incentivise uh, withdrawal from the civil servants of young people into the private sector. So I think these are very valid questions that should be posed. Yeah. Chair, Chair, I would like to know the answer to one further question. You can reduce to at least four days. Can you reduce to one day a week? It's subject to your line management agreement. Oh, well, it's subject, I understand it's subject to line management agreement. I think I would quite like to have next HR to come in and sort of explain this more yeah. in front of the committee. Yeah. I mean, I think, if I may, Chair, just the, one of the points about if this is a management decision, then what you are doing is effectively devolving. There will be individual people in middle ranking and junior managerial positions who are then faced with a situation where they may have a business need in their area to continue having that experienced person working, and this allows them, and they've got a willing person in their 60s who's totally happy to keep to technically retire but continue working more than nearly full time. Um, that is may well be a perfectly rational decision for a line manager to make in their particular situation because they need to keep a service or or a part of a department or body going. But what is Nick's HR doing to look at it from an overall perspective, from a policy perspective? This is you know if you create a structure that is incentivising people to take this option and incentivising managers to agree to it. Then, well, I mean, the other issue is that, and again, this is why I would like to have next next HR to come and explain it to us. What is the sort of uh, grade level that this is taking place on? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, if we're looking at um, sort of around nine percent, and it's mostly at the senior grades doing this mm -hmm. position, I mean, it's you know, you, you start seeing a sort of a pattern here. It nearly becomes a you know a, another. Sorry, I hate to use the word perk, but it nearly seems to be a sort of, sort of continuation of sort of terms and conditions of the of the job. And if it's if it's granted at um, potentially at uh, sort of that level, you know, it's it's become custom and practice. Yeah. And how then are the missing days being covered? Yeah. Are, they, are they using agency, or how are they? Are there temporary promotions, or how is yeah. that working? Yeah, and just add to that then too. If it is if it is about a retention of expertise yeah. in a given field or department, then how is that utilised by that department? Uh, Malisha. Uh, yeah. So the chair, first of all, I probably should chair Mintis here, been a retired lecturer himself, but it was something I was always very much opposed to, uh, the very notion that people could retire and post and then come back maybe to the same institution and continue working. Uh, and I do think of this question has to be answered there, even though there are exceptional circumstances at times that whereby uh, either the person has reached the, the age of retirement or whatever, you know, but that when they may be unable to recruit to a particular post, but other than that, you know, for it to become uh, the, the common practice in which it was 
uh, actually the case in too many institutions to date. Uh, as I say, I was always totally opposed to it. Mm. Look, I think we've got a consensus around the committee that we'd like to get Nick's HR to come in and explain this to us. I think if we're agreed. Yeah. Yeah, the committee already agreed to take a briefing from Nick's HR on capability and capacity. Um, so maybe when they come to brief on that in the autumn, they cover this too, and I could write to them in the meantime. To I think we need to write to them anyhow and say yeah. we do. Well, you know, we, the committee has concerns about this, and we would wish to. We will be asking them uh, details on that. Very good. Okay, uh, moving from that to item, uh, the next item, the Civil Service Injury Benefits Scheme. Members are asked to consider at page 644 correspondence from the Department asking the Committee of its intention to undertake a formal consultation on proposals to reform the Civil Service Injury Benefits Scheme Northern Ireland. The liability associated with injury claims, most of which originate in the prison service, has nearly doubled in two years to around 77 million with around 3 million of claims per annum, an increase of over 200 per cent in five years. This increase appears to be linked to non-time limited PTSD claims. The consultation discusses breaking the link with the pension scheme, defining injury on duty, imposing a time limit of three months on claims. Currently, claims can be backdated for decades. I find that absolutely unbelievable that somebody is even considering that. Pardon, excuse me. Eliminating lump sum payments, introducing offsetting which might reduce payments if claimants are re-employed, periodical reviews of claims and ending payments at state pension age. The consultation will run from 7th of June 21 until the 10th of September 21. A copy of the consultation and policy screening documents have been provided. Um, it is also noted that the Committee for Justice has not been scheduled consider has not scheduled consideration for this matter. Do members feel that an oral brief is needed from the Department, perhaps at the end of the consultation period? And are we content to share the consultation with the Committee for Justice? Uh, just before we say anything, I, when I read that and sort of I looked at the issue about imposing a time limit on claims, particularly on PTSD that can develop at any stage from sort of virtually immediately up to a decade afterwards, I think. Uh, I, that fills me with an enormous amount of concern about sort of the consultation and the processes going that way. So, so when does the three months start? That's a, another question we don't have. Yeah. I, it's, you know, it, I feel I feel very uncomfortable with the the direction of this is this is uh, this is heading in. Any other comments? Do I can I just check? You feel uncomfortable with this consult the, the direction the consultation is going in? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's too quick, or because it's so to to say that somebody has to claim for injury within three months, yeah. and one of the reasons they think that there's been a substantial increase in the number of people claimants over the two hundred percent is due to PTSD. Yeah, PTSD by its very nature is long term. Is long term. Yeah. and indeed, if we you know remember the debates we have had in the assembly, particularly around sort of prison officers, yeah, people yeah, yeah. over the fire service, and all the rest of it. And this seems to be a, a method. I, I I have real concerns over this, but I think you know, I think we should be. Um, I think we should be receiving an oral briefing in this. I think at the end of the consultation period is probably appropriate. I think I'll probably I'll probably uh, add to the consultation process separately, but not as the chair. And are we content to share the consultation with the committee for justice? Maybe we should be writing to the committee for justice now and say this is happening, and they should be taking an interest in it. Yep. Yeah, person, to be clear, I, I don't think they're disinterested. They no. just don't, they aren't aware. This yeah. hasn't been said. Asked the clerk, and she hasn't seen it. So yeah. I think it's I think it's she indicated they, they, she thought they would be very interested. Yeah, I think uh, sort of in that sort of if we if I have your consent, we'll uh, contact the committee for justice and say this is ongoing. Okay. Okay. Right. Are we content? Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, social value and procurement workshop. Members are asked to note page six seven six a response from the department to the committee's request for a short written review of the social value and procurement work workshop. Matthew. Uh, well, I haven't had my. I was as as I said to the clerk, I was going to have a very brief period of time, and I was hoping to get from the department something more a, subst a substantive brief debrief, um, which I haven't had yet. So, I I um I, we uh, we can discuss it if if you're content, chair. Once I've had that more substantive debrief from the department. Yeah. Thank you. Are we agreed? Good. Okay. Uh, moving on to Peace Plus consultation. Members are asked to note at page 715 a briefing paper provided by SEUPB in advance of the appearance of the TEO committee on the 26th of May. The paper covers the Peace Plus consultation. Any comments? Content to note? Agreed. 
<laughs> Red Diesel in Pleasure Craft. <laughs> Members are asked to note on page 727 the departmental response regarding the use of Red Diesel in Pleasure Crafts. The department appears to advise that the additional flexibility which was to apply in Northern Ireland is restricted to non propulsion use. Uh, you will be aware that I have contacted some of my friends in my previous employment in the Royal Navy and asked them what the use of diesel is in non propulsion use, and they were rather confused by the question. So, obviously, there are sort of differing views on this. And believe it or not, this would be, appear to be a very limited benefit. Surprise, surprise. The Department has identified the stakeholder that Her there, Majesty there. Treasury has engaged with and indicates that further guidance is to be issued. Are we content to note and await further guidance? Well, it is farcical, Chair, because you, you, can't, uh, you can use red diesel not to move your, ve your vessel, but to run its ancillary services. So what do you mean to have? Two tanks? Mm. Yeah, I think it's farcical. Yeah. Talking of farcical, a response from Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Members are asked to note at page 734 a response to the committee from the Chief Secretary of the Treasury declining to provide oral evidence on the impact of delays on the devolved budget resetting process. Would members like to make any comments? Uh, I would just say, Chair, it's um, deeply disappointing that the, the tre in the context of um, being more um, engaged, to put it diplomatically, in how uh, devolved administrations operate, that the Treasury continues to refuse to offer us the basic courtesy of an evidence session. And I think it's actually quite disappointing and discourteous. Give me perhaps the, perhaps me the Department of Finance's uh, erstwhile permanent secretary, who is, uh, is, is in a position to fight our cause. But anyway. Can you get me another D? Because I feel a letter coming on. We've got dis disappointed and discourteous. I, mean, I personally think it's completely reasonable. I would, if you, if you, I mean, I'll have, I just, I mean, I think like it, 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 it's genuinely a, a, a reasonable request for us to have or to have. We've now been sitting for uh, like since the institution restarted for nearly eighteen months, and we've got through a lot of business, uh, some controversy, legislation, and at the centre of all that's been the treasury and their refusal to simply give us oral evidence about related matters is, I think, just not good. I think we should be writing to them to make that clear. Sorry, Malicia, Philip, do you want to come in? Lisa, you got your hand up? No, I had my hand up. I had up the last time it wasn't taken. All right, again. okay. My apologies, Malicia. Okay. Um, so I'm more than content to write again to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. And I think I would um, info it to um, the Cabinet Secretary, um, who is. Um, has oversight and responsibility the rest of it to do with the uh, functioning of the, uh, of the union and improving communications across the union and the devolved administrations. And I think it, second, the second permanent secretary? Yeah, second, yeah I can't remember. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And sort of to info copy that. And I think uh, if we can craft a suitable letter that uses the words disappointed, discourteous, dismayed and dejected. Dismayed, dismayed. I think I would be more than content to uh, sign off on that letter, and I think our committee would be as well. And if we can get to the to the, the square of four, or to the to the I was going to say the cube root to the power of four, we might try the power of five next. <laughs> and, contra and contrary to that, the Rector's budgetary oversight report. Uh, the members asked to note at page 736 a, a copy of the report by the Rector's committee on budget oversight on the framework for engagement on the budget cycle of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, members, are we contented to note? Um, I would just like to thank the, uh, uh, the Oireachtas Budgetary Oversight Organisation for their sort of swift response, and I thought that's um, a marked contrast that we've seen in other places. Uh, also, uh, if we do reach the stage where we're still in session in uh, the autumn and uh, sort of COVID restrictions allow, I think there might be an opportunity at some stage for a uh, to consider a visit, uh, so that we can sort of take um, some more oversight in that sort of area as well. I'm not a great fan of political tourism, but I think both from the Scots and the um, sort of the Irish, we've seen sort of quite good practice that I think it'd be worthwhile us t taking a sort of a closer look at. Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, item 10, changing places toilets. Members are asked to note at page 828, correspondence from the Department notifying the Committee as to issue a technical booklet under building regulations respect of changing places toilets. A regularly impact assess assessment is to be published. Are we content to note? Okay. Uh, uh, move to item 11, Department response on the sale of Port of Reservoir. Members are asked to note at page 837 a further response from the Department on the sale of Port of Reservoir. A considerable amount of information has been provided. The Department contends that the property could not be sold as one lot and that obligations in respect of forestry and reservoir devalued the land. It is contended that value for money was obtained. Members got anything they would wish to say? Oh gosh, I wish I'd have known it or bought it myself at that price. <laughs> you, know, you could hardly buy a, a souped-up car for that sort of money, and yet you can get yourself your own private reservoir and estate. You only get cheaper land in Port Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I didn't notice any reservoirs for sale for a pound. <laughs> um, I'm aghast. I mean, I just, uh, what can we do? I mean, it's just an extraordinary decision. Uh, an, an opportunity wasted, I feel, to obtain good value for the public first. But, I mean, it's maybe just for the North Down MLAs to, to pursue. But uh, I'd sort of, there's something I particularly, I'm uh, sorry, committee, there's something I particularly gets to me. It's sort of what I think is sort of opportunities that I'm not thinking that we're getting good value for money, particularly uh, in where we're selling off resources and the rest of it. I have a concern about the prices and looking at some of the prices of that have been quoted in this piece. And I have no doubt that with all the work that LPS and everybody has been involved with, that is seen as being, you know, what would be a reasonable price. However, you know, I'm minded to ask potentially the Northern Iron Audit Office to have a look into this, because if this is how the pricing has been doing for selling off surplus government land, and there are some quite valuable pieces of real estate out there, but I don't think we are getting good value for money. And if this is seen as the process, you know, it's too difficult, so therefore we'll sell it off cheaply to get it off our hands. Okay, you like appendix one of the page 840 gives you various reservoirs they've sold, some as low as just over £600 an acre. Yeah. Quite astounding. I would, uh, look, I don't know whether they would uh, consider looking at it, but I would like to write for us, I would like to write as the chairman and with the committee to say, could you, if you are considering an investigation, so are we getting good value from, or is there good value for money on particularly the sale of reservoirs and forestry lands? I think, it, it, you know, I'm, there's something about this that doesn't, Ask the smell test, and it just makes me a bit worried, Sir Paul. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm just reading through the letter again, uh, and again, I think they do highlight the issue around the reservoirs bill and the considerable responsibilities that are now placed on reservoir owners with regards to risk and maintenance and then management uh, with structural engineers and, and somewhat. So that may have a bearing, um, and they might be justified then by saying, well, look, we've, we've reduced the burden on the public pound or whatever. But, you know, that might be the case. I'm not saying it is, but it might be a factor. Uh, but again, looking at Annex 1 and the years, I was on the Agriculture Committee when we went through the Reservoirs Bill, and I'm trying to remember the timeline uh, of when that came in. 2013, was it? Well, yeah, so, yeah. Maybe not as late, maybe not as early as that, maybe it was later uh, than that, but again, that might, I'm trying to find Appendix uh, 1 now. 8840. 8840. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you can see there. It would be interesting to see if there's a differential in cost or charge whenever, uh, you know, post reservoirs bill and pre-reservoirs bill, and if that has made a, a bearing on, on uh, seal agreed uh, pricing. Yeah, but I think the other issue we have as well is that, you know, uh, cost of a, a reservoir uh, has a particular cost and maintenance cost for making sure that, but when there's no water in it, it's not a reservoir anymore. And it becomes, it can become quite a valuable piece of land. I, I just, I just, I, I just have, I wouldn't. It may, it may be nothing, 
but I just sense that you know, as people that are trying to protect at least the public purse and saying good value for money, I, w I think I would quite happy to uh, write to them to, to do that and see if they're willing to, to look at it if you were content. Yeah, I, th I think there was also an issue too, not with the reservoir being changed or uh, changed in any way, but also with the downstream. So if, if, if there's a new village springs up half a mile downstream uh, with a thousand or two thousand new homes, then that had a bearing on the reservoir itself and the, uh, the risk and the effect, uh, which then could have could input into decisions to, see, to sell. So yeah. th th this could be more complex than we just think with regards to, well, look, this is just people getting rid of land. Uh, yeah. for but there are situations like at Corbett and Banbridge where it was sold to the council for public good. Yes. And yeah. it's now effectively a public park. Yeah. Which, uh, and that's perfectly acceptable, I think, in that situation. But to a private potential developer, I think, you know, there's something, I think, I would agree with the chair, I think the audit office needs to have a, a little yeah. look at this. I would agree with that too, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, today. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for your indulgence on in that. Uh, composite request. Members can ask to consider the composite request at page 879. Are we content with an accurate and complete record of the committee's information request? Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, moving on to the forward work programme. Revised draft forward work programme is page 891. Uh, owing to the failure of the department to provide information to assembly research on COVID bids 2021, we have a much shorter, we'll have a much shorter brief from assembly research next week. As indicated previously, on the 2nd of June, we will have raised, followed by the Department on main estimates and budget bill again. The committee will be asked through its views on accelerated passage for the budget number two bill, and I'll write to the speaker immediately thereafter, seeking those views out. Do we have any comments? Or are we content? Content. Uh, Jim, the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill requires departments to provide committees with a written or oral brief on the monitoring grounds within seven days after the submission date to the Department of Finance, which is on the 4th of June. The department, Department's table guidance to other departments on in-year monitoring reflects this. Clark has therefore requested that the Department provide a written brief to be considered at the meeting on the 9th of June. In addition, the Committee previously also agreed to consider an oral and written brief in advance of the submission date on the 2nd of June 21. Furthermore, the committee has also agreed to consider an oral and written overview briefing on the outcome of the overall June monitoring round on the 30th of June, followed by the Assembly's statement on the 28th of June. Are we content to note and are we agreed? Noted and agreed. Uh, members are asked to consider correspondence from the committee for the Executive Office regarding the concurrent meeting on the 16th of June. On page 895, the TEO committee asked the Finance Committee to suggest stakeholders from whom written submissions might be sought. In respect of COVID recovery and the High Street Task Force in advance of the meeting, I've given a few names to the uh, names to the clerk. I was thinking about Aidan Conley. I was thinking about Glenn Roberts, and I was also thinking about uh, Tina McKenzie or somebody from FSB. Has anybody got any other names they would like to consider? Well, Roger Powell from FSB would be the the name that would. Um, uh, I wonder uh, if it, we aren't creating too much work. Um, if a couple of people who are like people who are like town centre managers for local authorities, That's town centre manager. Right. Yeah, I, I should know the name, the name of the person from Belfast, but they escaped would, me. Would we consider uh, adding to that list because it's also a TE list asking Simon Holland to come along? Yeah, because I know he's been doing quite a lot recently on sort of Belfast and regeneration the high street in Belfast. Yeah, I think. Um, Chamber of Commerce is there? Yeah, Belfast Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, and then the other um, uh, people I think we should he hear from are people in, in commercial property. Uh, I think one of the, you know, the leading indicator for what's happening to the high street, the, the leading indicator we all know about what's happening to the high street are the number of, well, it sort of operates success sequentially, bookie shops. Uh, and certain other types of shops uh, on struggling high streets, followed by to let signs. We, those are the looking, leading indicators that we all look for in high streets. Um, so commercial property people, I think, are actually able to give a very because they are. Uh, that, that's in, in no way to cast aspersions on some of the trade bodies we've mentioned, but they are. They're all very good, but they're all interested in, in the best possible sense. You know, maximising. Um, the, the interests of members, and, and that's a good thing. That's why we want to hear from them. But commercial property guys will be able to give us. So one of the commercial uh, state agents. 
well, that, but also um, someone who involved, uh, I'm sure when I think about it, I'm sure riffing in the middle of a committee meeting which probably isn't right, but I'm happy to go away and have a think about yeah, the names. Yeah, please. Because, yeah, okay, I'll have a think. I just think there, that it's very important that we get that viewpoint too, and there will be, um, so you know, we could, for example, invite uh, you know, people who, um, uh, you know, real estate analysts for mm -hmm. major banks, or one of one or two of the major banks, or even, I mean, this, would be, this is less so here, but um, uh, you know, in London, some of the investment banks who invest in that's not really is less relevant here, but um, you know, they have a kind of hard-edged view of the the economic dynamics that affect high streets, and um, so. Okay, now you can revert back yeah, to the accent on to do that as well. Okay. What are we giving the new, if there is a new economy minister, what are we giving him a good grilling? And here, here. Here, here. To call him across the coals. Him? Chair, how is that meant system. to work? It's in this room. Yeah. Is it going to be in this room or is it going to be in there? I think it will be in this room. It's uh, three um, committees will be meeting at once, so I will have a chat with the clerk of the committee for the executive office. Some members will be able to ascend and some will have to dial in, so we'll could, try our best. Can I suggest, Chair, if, or Clark, if it's not too much hassle, um, I'm like Melissa, I've sat on the PAC where we've met in the Assembly Chamber, mm -hmm. and you can fit more people. So there is a precedent of that working, and if that's a way of getting more, and obviously we know it has all the AV and, and everything else to work, if there's a way of making that work and getting as many of us in the room as possible, I think that would be helpful. I also think it would make maximise, you know, if you know, if, we, if part of what we do is trying to allow the public out there to see what we're doing and the media to cover it, then we stand more chance of that happening than if it's a effectively a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are we content with the forward work program? Oh sorry, final final item. Uh, the speaker advised that the summer recess will now commence on the tenth of July. Is the committee can still content to have its last meeting on the thirtieth of June? I think we'll probably be I think we'll probably have enough business for a further committee meeting. I would be more content to have a, uh, a another committee meeting uh, the 7th of July, on the seventh of July. Okay. Uh, any other comments on the forward work programme? Are we agreeing the forward work programme? Agreed. Uh, any other business? Excellent. Uh, time to next meeting, sir, uh, Wednesday, the second of June, fourteen hundred here in the Senate Chamber and on Starley. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for your. We you. you actually finished early. Okay. Good. Well done. Well done. Thank you, everybody. I know. We'll say how, how much we appreciated Paul Frew being with us for the last fourteen months. We really <laughs> <laughs> time. Uh, Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern